Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear students, uh, thank you very much for your waiting and for your time. Uh, please accept our apologies for this small delay. However, I would like to introduce you the Consul General of Kingdom Denmark. Is it right? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lindmark uh, would like to present you a brief introduction into the Denmark economy and its perspective on the Russian market. So just let me one minute, I will start the presentation. Дорогие друзья, извините за опоздание, у нас была очень содержательная беседа сейчас, мы проговорили о ваших перспективах, о трудоустройстве возможной дочерней компании предприятий Королевства Дания здесь, в России, обсудили вопросы знакомства более тесного с представителями бизнеса, которые приезжают сюда, в Санкт-Петербург из Дании, Мы надеемся, что ряд из них смогут выступить перед вами, потому что то направление подготовки, которое у нас есть и где вы занимаетесь, оно, безусловно, важно. Страны Северной Европы, регион Балтийского моря, российско-европейские экономические контакты, они остаются всегда важны и для России, и для Санкт-Петербурга, и для нашего университета. И я благодарен, что сегодня генеральный консул Королевства Дании у нас в гостях и расскажет вам о тех вопросах бизнеса, как Лиза вам уже сообщила на английском языке. Надеюсь, что это очень поможет вам в дальнейшей вашей учебной, научной, исследовательской деятельности и при вопросах трудоустройства. Я попрошу Елизавету сейчас тогда продолжить вести нашу встречу и хочу предоставить слово генеральному консулу Королевства Дании в Санкт-Петербурге. Please, welcome your speech now. Спасибо вам большое. Uh, thank you very much for coming and for waiting. Uh, sorry, we are a bit late. I'm also sorry to, to join you uh, this afternoon on such a sad day for, for the city of uh, St. Petersburg. Um, it, it was indeed a very, very sad weekend. And, uh, and we, we feel it very, very closely also in the, in the Royal Danish Consulate General. Uh, the topic of my lecture this afternoon is uh, opportunities for, for Danish companies in the Russian Federation. Um, and I will go through the following agenda to tell a little bit about our consulate, um, what we do, uh, who we are, a little bit about Denmark, but, but not too much, uh, and then move into the different uh, sectors of the Danish economy and, uh, and the examples of companies uh, that are active and successful within these sectors. Uh, whenever I touch upon a sector, there will be uh, one or maybe two case companies, and, and hopefully some of them will be known to you uh, because they are active on the Russian market. Uh, other, other companies will be new to you, so I hope you will, you will all learn something uh, today. Uh, so uh, my workplace is the Royal Danish Consulate General. It's, it's a mission under the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Datsky Mit. Uh, we have the embassy in Moscow, which is our, of course, largest representation uh, here in the Russian Federation, um, with around 45 people in, in the embassy. Then we have uh, here, uh, where Nevsky and Moika are, are crossing, uh, we have the Consulate General with uh, seven, seven employees. Uh, and what we do is we assist Danish companies uh, here in Russia. We actually also assist Danish companies who are interested in uh, the Belarusian market, uh, in Kazakhstan and, and some of the other Central Asian republics. Uh, but of course, the main, the main thing is, is Russia. Uh, we arrange different uh, promotions. We arrange uh, what we call market visits, where we have a group of, of Danish companies uh, going maybe to a region uh, and visit a specific sector of the, of the Russian economy. We do also individual, uh, individual assignments for the Danish companies, uh, assist uh, the companies in finding a Russian uh, business partner, or setting up uh, a production site. Uh, and we, we work all the time with uh, business-to-business -business, uh, contacts. 
Also, we do some uh, business to government work, meaning that we, we try to open doors to the, to the Russian authorities for the, for the Danish businesses. Um, of course, the economy consists, as you know, of a lot of, of different sectors. And with only seven people, we cannot cover all the, all the sectors of the economy. Uh, but what we focus on here in St. Petersburg, that's uh, machinery and technology sector. And it's also the energy and environment sector. Uh, whereas our colleagues in Moscow, they, uh, they work with healthcare, they work with the whole retail sector, business to consumer, uh, they work with the global public affairs, so much more on the, on the government relation uh, side, um, and also they work within agriculture. So a brief, brief uh, facts about Denmark. It's a very small country uh, with uh, very few people. Uh, so 5.5 million, I think it's, it's less than the population here in, in St. Petersburg. Uh, our capital city is Copenhagen with around 1 million people. Uh, we have a lot of islands, uh, the big islands um, that you can see on, on the map, but also several smaller islands. So. Uh, more than 400 islands altogether, and uh, more than 7,000 kilometers of uh, coastline. Uh, then we have a very unique uh, concept, uh, the Danish word. I think it's the only Danish word in my presentation, hygge, and it means uh, coziness, uyutnost. Uh, so to be together, have a good time together. Uh, of course, especially when you have uh, holidays like uh, New Year, like Christmas, like uh, birthday parties. Uh, you come together with family and friends and, and enjoy this uh, hygge. Uh, we are quite, quite proud that the Danes are measured year after year to be among the happiest people in the world. Uh, and I, I have a separate slide about that. Um, and, and I believe that part of the reason is we have a welfare state. We have a system that is actually helping us throughout life so from small children that can go to, uh, to kindergartens, to preschools, to schools uh, without paying for it. And if you get sick, you can go to the hospital all the way to you are old. You are actually in a home for old people and the society, the state takes care of you. Um, this also leads to a high degree of equality in the, in the Danish society. And uh, we have very low levels of uh, corruption. Uh, this is actually not very easy for you to read, but you can see at the top three of the happiest people in the world are Switzerland, Iceland and Denmark on the third place. Uh, we used to be number one actually for some years, but I don't know why we are now number three. Uh, and you can find also Norway, Finland, Sweden in the top ten, so these uh, Nordic countries, the, the Nordic neighbors. Uh, here's the Transparency International Index, which is a quite a recognized um, uh, corruption perception score, where you have actually Denmark as the least corrupt uh, country, uh, followed by New Zealand. Also, we have some of, the, some of the other Scandinavian and Nordic countries, again, in the top five, the top ten. Uh, and then uh, I have included the countries in the Eurasian Economic Union, uh, Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Russia, uh, with, with their ranking. Um, and, and I actually believe it's, it's very important for an economy to have a low level of, uh, of corruption. And it's uh, also somehow connected to, uh, to, our, to our happiness. Uh, I mentioned a few facts about the welfare system, uh, such as free schools and healthcare, uh, social security. If you if you lose your job, uh, again you will you will still be be paid uh, a reasonable amount of money, so you can you can survive, you can feed your children, even though you are unemployed. Uh, and even if you are employed, you have a relatively high uh, minimum wage. Um, of course, this welfare model, it costs a lot of money. Uh, so this whole system, the whole model is, is subsidized by the Danish state. And actually, if you, if you read the la last two points on the, on the slide, we have the, the highest tax rate, or one of the highest uh, tax rates in the whole world. So the marginal tax, the tax you pay on the, on the last uh, 
the last krone you own, uh, you, you earn, that's uh, actually more than 60%. On top of that, whenever you buy something, you need to pay 25% value-added tax. So, so, of course, it's nice to have this whole system, but every month when you receive your paycheck, you are also a little bit depressed because you can see how much is actually being deducted uh, to, to go to this big common uh, money box that is the, the welfare state. Um, there's another nice word up there called flex security. So it's actually a combination of the words flexibility and security. And it uh, describes the, the labor market in Denmark uh, with those two words. It's very flexible. It's actually quite easy for a Danish employer to, to fire people. Uh, he does not need to keep them very long. Uh, if he needs to, you know, reduce his workforce, he can he can say, okay, we used to be 200 people, but but because of the crisis, we will we will reduce by 50 people to 150. And these 50 people, of course, they will not be very happy when they lose their job. But again, they have the security, they have the welfare state taking care of them. Uh, so it's it's basically easy for the employer to uh, scale down and even scale up again when the crisis is over. Uh, but it's also uh, bearable for the uh, for the employee that even though he loses his job, he will still be uh, he will still be uh, protected. He will still receive uh, money every month. Uh, now I'll move a little bit more into the different sectors of the economy. Uh, I think these pictures up here that's that's some of the things that uh, Denmark is is uh, known for, like the Lego bricks. Uh, the wind turbines, of course, all our all our pigs. Uh, we have more than 10 million pigs in the country, and and as you as you heard, there are only 5.5 million people, so we are twice as many pigs as people. Uh, then we have the whole shipping industry, uh, symbolized by the by the containers. We have uh, healthcare and welfare technology, and we have beer, which is also uh, quite quite famous here in uh, here in Russia. Uh, we have included this uh, top 10 of uh, Danish companies uh, with, with their respective uh, sectors and their annual uh, revenue, the, the latest figure we were able to find. So most of them are last year's uh, revenue. And by far the largest one is uh, Maersk. Uh, you can see it's uh, three times the size of, of number two. Uh, actually, one, two, three, and six. I will get back to during the presentation with with a little bit more uh, cases. But I would like to to uh, draw your attention to the many agriculture and food companies that are actually present in uh, in top ten. So I mean, the whole food sector, the whole agriculture sector, is extremely important for the for the Danish uh, economy. We don't have any uh, car factories, we don't have any mines, uh, we don't have a lot of oil and gas. So, so we are very much depending on the, on the farmland and what we can grow on the farmland and what we can produce uh, after that. Uh, but the first sector I'll mention is actually the clean tech sector. So it's, it's the energy sector, but again, as the oil is, is running out uh, from our, our wells in the, in the North Sea, uh, we also need energy from, from other sources than, than oil and gas. Um, and in the last five years, the clean tech sector has been the fastest growing in the, in the Danish uh, economy. Uh, I showed you the picture of the wind turbines before you have them there in the, in the middle. Uh, and actually Denmark is one of the world's largest exporters of uh, wind turbines. Both the onshore kind standing on land, uh, but also offshore wind turbines. Uh, that go out and stand uh, on, on big foundations out in the in the sea. Uh, actually, it's already uh, now that 25% of our energy consumptions come from renewable sources, uh, so green and clean energy. Um, and if you only look at our electricity cons consumption, it's actually on windy days, it's more than 100% that is covered by the by the many wind turbines, uh, you know, running around every day, especially when it's windy. And it's often very windy in Denmark. Uh, 
I'll mention a few company names to you. I'm not sure if they are familiar, but at least Grundfos and Danfoss uh, and also Rockwool, they are all uh, also very active here in, in Russia. Um, maybe Danfoss, Novozymes, uh, Vestas and Dong are less, less active uh, here. Um, there's a strategic goal from from the government, from every government, even though we have sometimes a change of government, that the entire energy supply should be powered by renewables uh, 20, no, what is it, 35 years from now, uh, in 2050. Mm -hmm. So we have to move from the 25% of the energy consumption, which is now already a fact, to 100% in 35 years. Uh, and people say it's realistic. I mean, I'm not... Uh, I'm not promising that this will happen, but at least it's the, it's the target, it's the ambition. Uh, and in the bottom of the slide, there are some, some areas mentioned. Again, wind power, smart grid, which is also very connected to wind power. If you, if you have this uh, energy output, which is higher when the wind is blowing and lower when the weather is quiet, you actually need uh, your cables and your whole transformer or system to be able to handle. Uh, sometimes it's very much energy, sometimes it's only half, sometimes it's almost nothing. Uh, so you need to be able to supplement with the, with the other sources of energy which we can import from, from our neighbors in, in Sweden and Norway, for instance, uh, if the wind is not blowing. We also have the bioenergy, so that's uh, burning of um, uh, biomass uh, and actually also of, of gas from all the pigs. Uh, so you can create energy by, by, uh, by burning these uh, also renewable sources of energy. Uh, district heating, which is a strong point for, for Denmark, uh, how to get the heat out to the houses, how to distribute it, how to make sure it's uh, in the winter uh, a reasonable temperature inside, not too cold, also not too hot. And that you have the same temperature in one apartment in this side of the building, but the same temperature also in the other side of the building. So it's quite tricky and it, it uh, demands a lot of uh, pumps and uh, valves and different, uh, you know, small, small uh, technological items that, that the Danish companies have, uh, have good experience in uh, producing. Uh, and then I would like to mention also the waste management. So it's both the, the waste water and the solid waste that uh, we, we uh, reuse, recycle a lot. Uh, all these beer bottles, they go into, into recycling so they can become new beer bottles. Uh, but the same with our water is being purified and actually you can just open the tap in Denmark and drink, drink the water. Um, so, so the whole how to handle all the waste uh, from the society is also a strong, strong point from Denmark. Uh, now we have the first of the of the company cases. That's the pump pump manufacturer Grundfos, uh, with a revenue of uh, more than three billion euros uh, per year, uh, and the Russian operation is is like nine percent of that, so two two hundred sixty six million euro. Uh, worldwide, they have an annual production of six million uh, pumps and different accessories. Uh, the company is active in 45 countries and with uh, around 19,000 employees. Uh, and in Russia, um, active Grundfos have been active since 1992 uh, with, with just their uh, agent who, who was selling the pumps. But then the sales company was opened in 1998 and uh, quite a big factory in uh, Moskovska Oblast was, was built in, or opened in 2005. Uh, because the market for pumps here in Russia was really uh, increasing a lot. Uh, so the total investment is 13 million euros and there's a, a facility, a factory area uh, on the roof of uh, 100,000 square meters. So it's, it's quite a large, quite a modern, impressive uh, factory. And uh, as I said before, uh, you can also see it on the, on the, on the numbers. Uh, around 9% of the, of the turnovers in Russia, so Russia is among the most important markets for, for Grundfos. And actually I have uh, this picture of the, of the factory. Uh, you can also find it on, on uh, Google Maps and, and things like that. Uh, and a funny fact is to the, to the left you have another Danish manufacturer, 
which is Danfoss. They are making these uh, thermostats for the for the radiators and things like that, and they have a factory quite similar to the Grundfos factory, but slightly smaller, just on the other side of the of the road. So we have two Danish neighbors there in in Moskovska Oblast. Uh, then we go to the next uh, sector, which is the shipping and, and maritime equipment sector. Uh, it corresponds to 1.5% of the total Danish uh, gross domestic product. Uh, there's a uh, high emphasis on, uh, on energy efficiency, high tech, and it's also a fast developing sector. Um, and the reason why shipping is so big in Denmark is because traditionally, since we are a small country, we need to export our goods. So uh, on average, all over the Danish industry, 70% uh, of everything produced is actually being exported. Uh, of course, a lot to the neighboring countries like uh, Germany, Sweden, uh, the United Kingdom, but also to basically every country in the world. And to export that much, you need a lot of ships and trucks and, and, and things like that to, to move all the goods around. Uh, so, so that's basically the, the reason behind the successful shipping industry. Um, so the, the most famous, uh, most well-known uh, company is AP Müller Mask, sometimes just called Mask, which is the largest uh, container shipping uh, company in the whole world. But there are also some companies uh, within the equipment and technology sector, uh, Alfa Laval, Viking, who actually are active uh, here in St. Petersburg, uh, Lyngsø and Hempel. And here we have a few facts about the company Mask. Uh, they uh, made a revenue last year of uh, 35 billion euro. That's a lot of money. Uh, and 5 billion of that was, was profits. Uh, they have uh, 89,000 employees in the whole world and are active in 130 uh, countries. They have a lot of uh, port facilities also, uh, but of course their main asset is these uh, uh, container ships. You can see the ship down there with all the containers stacked. And they are also some of the largest uh, seagoing vessels in, in the whole world. They're, they're these uh, mass container ships. Um, the Russian uh, operation was actually founded in August 92 here in St. Petersburg uh, and still Mask has, a, has an office uh, here. But uh, they also have uh, offices in, in several other uh, Russian uh, cities, including Vladivostok. Uh, then they have a lot of uh, fully owned uh, subsidiaries, Mask Line is one of them, uh, APM, that's again AP Müller. Uh, terminals and even these other companies called Demco and Switzer. So they are subsidiaries of the whole group and they are all active here in Russia. Uh, and if you take that uh, impressive uh, 35 billion in, in worldwide revenues, uh, around 3% of that is, is from the Russian part of the operation. And actually three years ago, uh, Mask made an investment uh, in into the Russian port operator called Global Ports uh, and now owns 37.5% of, uh, of that company. So the next sector is, is maybe a little bit difficult to, to define because we call it niche technology, uh, including innovation. And uh, it's actually a, another of the Danish uh, specialities that uh, as I said, we don't have uh, these big uh, car manufacturers, we don't build airplanes, we don't build all this very big stuff, but we build a lot of small pieces, uh, make a lot of small in inventions, maybe take a pump, which, which can also be made in, in Germany, and then make it just 10% better or 20% better. Uh, so, so there are actually a, a whole uh, part of the economy which is, uh, is belonging to these niche companies with uh, unique, very specific uh, technologies. Uh, because, uh, as I also said in the beginning, the minimum wage in Denmark is very high. It's probably like 14, 15 euro per hour. That's the minimum wage. Uh, 
you need you need to think very smart when you build a Danish factory. Uh, and 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 uh, one of the things that that a lot of Danish manufacturers is doing, they they do automation. Some of it is with robots, you know, robots that can actually. Uh, handle things, but but it can also be you know just an assembly line where where things are being uh, moved without persons handling it or with minimum handling of of, uh, of uh, persons. So all the time, try to be smart, try to optimize, try to do it five percent, ten percent better than you did last year, uh, and and in that way be more efficient. Uh, and of course, the robot technology is, is, is one of the fields, but, but there are also many other uh, such uh, solutions. Um, I know also that, that uh, here in Russia, China is, is like a big topic, uh, what to do with China. You know, they, they can make everything in China, and if they cannot make it, they will just buy one of our nice things, and then they will copy it and start making it. Uh, but a lot of these things in the, in the niche markets, they are very difficult to copy because it's not only the hardware, there's also the software part, there's also the know-how part. Mm -hmm. So you cannot just copy this, uh, this thing, uh, you need the whole package. So it's actually quite difficult for, for the Chinese competitors to, to go into these, uh, these markets. Uh, I mentioned a few companies uh, in the bottom of the slide, but I don't think any of them are, are really known uh, here in Russia. But we have one uh, case about the company Welltech, uh, which is operating within the oil, oil industry. Uh, it's also a Danish-owned company with a, with a revenue of uh, 300 million, and actually more than half of that was profit, so they're really making a lot of money. Uh, because they have, the, again, this unique technology, nobody can copy it, uh, they can sell it. They uh, employ more than 1,000 people in 45 offices around the world. Uh, here to say, no, okay, the company itself was from 94, but the Russian subsidiary was only six years ago, in 2009. And of course, they started with one office uh, in Moscow, but now uh, Welltech already operates five five offices here. And uh, even though there's a crisis and sanctions, Welltech is is planning to uh, to move on and actually uh, develop the Russian market further. Uh, I can tell you that uh, Welltech this year received the Medal of Honor from our our Queen's husband. He has a medal for these. People were really doing good things for Danish export, and that went to Welltech. So uh, I was there in Moscow when they received this medal and the certificate, and they were very proud and very happy about that. Um, next sector, uh, which I think you remember is the most important one uh, in the whole in the whole Danish economy, which is the agriculture and related food technologies. So Denmark uh, exports food products to more than 130 countries uh, all over the world. Also, you know, China and Japan and, and, and places like that. Uh, and it's actually more than 24% of uh, our total export, uh, which is from this sector. Uh, I think I mentioned that the most of the export is to the neighboring countries, uh, especially Germany, but also the UK and uh, Sweden, uh, Norway, Holland, Poland, so, so these uh, immediate neighbors. Uh, but we also have a significant export outside the European Union and uh, a lot went to Russia uh, until, until uh, this whole uh, sanctions and import restriction regime started. Uh, a lot of uh, pork meat, a lot of uh, dairy products went to Russia. Uh, now this goes to, to other places, uh, even as far away as, as China and Japan. Uh, Danish food products are known for the consistent uh, quality and, and uh, good hygiene, the good uh, control in every part of the process. Uh, and of course, there's a whole niche here again uh, related to food. It's not the food itself, but it's all the equipment you need to, to, uh, to cut the pig into very nice uh, thin slices and to uh, package it in a nice uh, tight way so that it can last for, for three or four weeks. So, so all of this uh, 
related to, to, to the food, but not being the food itself. That's another strong point of, of uh, Denmark. Uh, and basically, if, if you take the topic of my whole lecture, the opportunities for Danish companies in Russia, this is really where we see an opportunity now. Because Russia is building up uh, her own production of, of food, uh, but Russia also needs some uh, of these advanced manufacturing technologies, uh, which could come from, from Denmark. Uh, you have the agricultural land, you have the pigs, you have the cows, but you still need uh, to, to, to get it from, uh, from the ground to the table. So there's a whole, you know, step-by-step -step process, uh, all the way from the, from the agricultural land until you can actually put your fork into it and, and, and put it into your mouth. And throughout this chain, uh, Danish technologies can play a, a big role, actually. Uh, we can make the production faster. We can uh, increase the security of the food so that you don't get ill from eating it. And it can be more efficient in, in different ways. Uh, I have a few cases. Uh, actually, they are, they, are, they are the farmers from Denmark who actually established themselves in the Russian Federation. So in uh, Veliki Novgorod, there's uh, quite a big uh, uh, Danish farm which was founded uh, 11 years ago. And they brought the first of the breeding pigs uh, 10 years ago into Russia. Uh, and now there are 100 people. Uh, I think there are three or four only three Danish people there, the rest are, are local Russians, uh, of course. Uh, and they have a very good connection in the village where they are working, because, of course, uh, this village is very happy that there's a, there's a successful uh, farming company there uh, that can support the local economy, pay taxes and, and employ people. Um, and then Nosvin is, is like one of the examples, the small one with, with 100 people, uh, but we also have uh, Idavang, which is uh, even much, much larger. It's in uh, Leningradska Oblast and in Pskovska Oblast, uh, and uh, with a revenue of 19 million euro uh, last year, more than 900 people. So uh, this uh, Norsving was only 100 people. This is 10 times uh, as big. And actually, they uh, own or lease 133,000 square meters of land, and they uh, have 300,000 pigs. Uh, they are among the 20, uh, top 20 of, of uh, pork manufacturers on the Russian market. They have a total of 14 farms. Uh, some of them are in Lithuania, so some of them are inside the European Union, some of them are outside. Uh, and since 2008, they have, uh, they have had pork production here in Russia. Uh, one of the largest farms is in uh, the district of Tosno, not so far uh, to the south, and uh, is uh, clearly the largest taxpayer in that, in that area. Uh, yeah. Then, of course, we have uh, Karlsberg, and I sh I'm sure you know the Russian, the Russian name for Karlsberg. That's uh, Baltica. Uh, so Baltica is 100% owned by, uh, by Carlsberg Group with a, with a head office in, uh, in Copenhagen. Uh, but as you can also see from the numbers, uh, the 2 billion euro of, of revenue in Russia is actually a very high uh, proportion of the global revenue for the, for the Carlsberg Group. So it's uh, almost 25%. Uh, so Russia is, is clearly the most important uh, market for, for Carlsberg. There are currently eight breweries uh, operating here in, in Russia. Uh, the one first to the east is uh, Khabarovsk, so it's, it's quite far away. Mm -hmm. The largest one in all of Europe, that's actually here in St. Petersburg, uh, in, in a little bit in the north part. Uh, and it's, it's extremely impressive, very, very big brewery. Globally, more than 45,000 employees, and uh, if you remember that top, top list of Danish companies I had in the beginning, Carlsberg is number six on that one. Uh, it started here in Russia in 2008 when Carlsberg 
bought more than 50% of the shares so that it was uh, the dominant or controlling shareholder of Baltica Breweries. And then uh, three years ago, uh, it bought the rest of the shares, so, so now it's 100% owned. Uh, and actually, uh, the different brands of uh, Baltica Carlsberg, also the um, Kronenburg is mentioned up there, and, and all the Russian brands, they are 75% of the total volume uh, in, uh, in Russia. So it's, it's very dominant. Uh, then we have another interesting case, uh, which is uh, Arla Foods, uh, with uh, again more than 10 million euro in, in annual revenues, 90% uh, of its business uh, outside of Denmark, 18,000 employees, and it's, it was number three on the, on the list you saw in the beginning. Um, actually, it came as a merger between uh, Swedish and, and Danish dairy manufacturers, uh, and it's now the world's seventh largest dairy company. Uh, it's owned by the farmers, so it's not a stock company. It's, it's a very special ownership structure, so it's actually owned by all the farmers. Uh, but as you can see, it's, it's more or less all over the world, including uh, Africa, Middle East, uh, and of course Russia. Uh, Arla Foods is really one of the companies who have had uh, difficult times with the sanctions and the, and the embargo because uh, it's impossible to, to export the milk from Denmark to, to Russia. And uh, since the company is owned by the Danish farmers, of course they would like their milk to be in their cheese, if you understand what I mean. Uh, so even though the, the company is still active here in Russia, still uh, produces, um, it's with Russian milk. And uh, of course the farmers who are the owners, they are not happy about that. They need to get rid of the milk in, in other markets and, and the price is lower uh, because of that. Uh, so Arla, they, you can say they are, they are actually suffering uh, from, from the sanctions. Uh, I'm not sure if you know some of the brands from, from the supermarkets. Uh, Castello, that's a cheese, Lurpak, uh, which is not available anymore because, because Lurpak is exclusively made from Danish, uh, Danish milk. But Natura is made with the same recipe, just with Russian milk, so it's actually quite okay. Puk, Abatina, that's these white cheeses and, and different cheese. Yeah. Also mozzarella and uh, feta, feta cheese uh, under this Abatina brand. Uh, and actually, the, the strategy of Ala Foods is to wait for the whole situation to get better. Uh, they like to be recognized here. Of course, they would really like to, to get the milk uh, in again uh, at some point. So the next sector is uh, what I call Danish design. Uh, actually, Denmark is one of the most recognized uh, design nations in the world, uh, known for very simple design, very functional design, uh, and of course, high quality. Uh, and you can see in the bottom, some of the brands, like or the companies actually, Lego, I'm sure you know, Echo uh, Shoes, also quite active here. Uh, Fritz Hansen, that's furniture. I'm not sure how well known it is, but even Pandora, uh, it's this jewelry, is quite known uh, in Russia. And Pandora is, is the case here uh, with uh, 1.6 billion euro revenue. So it's not a small company, uh, more than 11,000 uh, people, 1,400 uh, stores in the whole world, uh, in 90 countries actually. And it was founded in 82. Many of the other companies are actually older. The other companies I've told about, they are, they are quite much older than this. This is a relatively new company. Um, and uh, it has been active since uh, 2010 here in Russia with the first six stores uh, in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. But now uh, Pandora has opened 140 stores uh, in, in, throughout the Russian Federation. Uh, and it's actually seven percent of the of the Pandora stores on the whole in the whole world. Uh, and even though there's a crisis, then the Pandora they they see more growth opportunities and they keep on opening uh, and expanding. Then we have uh, Lego, of course, a very very famous brand. Uh, I believe it's actually on the top ten of 
you know, knowledge about the brand worldwide. Coca-Cola is number one, uh, and Pepsi is probably somewhere in top five, but, but Lego is also in, in top ten, uh, just from this brand recognition, uh, which can be measured. Uh, and uh, revenue almost four, uh, it, should, it should be billion, not million, four billion euro, and uh, it makes it the largest toy company uh, in the world. 13,000 employees and number 16 on, on the list of, uh, of top 20 companies in Denmark. Uh, and it has been active since uh, the times of the Soviet Union uh, here uh, in Russia, so since uh, 1985, and uh, has slowly, steadily built uh, relations with, uh, with local uh, distributors and other partners. Uh, and actually, last year, uh, Lego experienced 13% growth uh, globally, so it's it's uh, it's quite imp quite impressive. Mm. Oh, sorry. Do you know if that's worldwide or in Russia? No. Mm. I, I know actually Lego is growing in Russia also in this time of of crisis, mm. but I don't know the percentage. Sure. Could be five or could be anything, but but they're still growing. Uh, whereas many other companies experienced the uh, decline, of course, uh, last year. Oh yeah, and it also says all of the market regions actually had a growth, including Russia. So it actually says that on, on the last line. Uh, I think the final sector I'll mention, now oh, there are two sectors left, so please bear with me. The health sector is actually 13% of the total Danish export. Uh, and 10% of, of that is uh, pharmaceuticals, so medicine, basically. Uh, and then we have 20 companies who are very dominant. They are more than 95%. Uh, it's, of course, concentrated in very large uh, companies who, who have research, who have the um, uh, economic muscle to, to invent and, and uh, get new uh, types of drugs uh, actually approved. Uh, and some of the core, uh, core areas, that's uh, diabetes, and then it's uh, medicine against uh, depression and against uh, allergy, and then there's different kinds of uh, vaccines. And uh, clearly the largest company in, in this uh, sector is Novo Nordisk, but there's also Leo and uh, Lundbeck. Uh, both of these are also active in Russia. Uh, Novo Nordisk uh, is a huge company. It's number two, as you can see on, on the list after the company Mask. Uh, it employs 400,000 people and has a revenue of uh, almost 12 billion euro. And uh, last year it was growing 12% uh, worldwide. So uh, they are a successful company, really. Uh, you can see the, the last line there, there's a name, Lars Rebien Sørensen. He was uh, awarded with the award for the best performing CEO in the world by some American business magazine or something. But it's like the Lionel Messi just of uh, CEOs, uh, the best of the best. Um, and, and they are uh, clearly key area is the diabetes medicine. Mm. Uh, active in 180 countries, so it's almost the whole world. There could be some few islands uh, out in the, in the Pacific Ocean where they're not active, but basically it's all over. Um, and it's, it's quite famous actually for opening a new factory in Russia uh, this year in the Kaluga, Kaluga region, Kalush, Kalushka Oblast. Um, so, you know, a lot of the competitors of Nova, they were thinking what to do in Russia and should we uh, decrease and should we go, go out of Russia, but they were actually opening a new factory. So uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it shows some commitment also to the, to the market. Last sector before uh, I'll give you the chance to ask questions, uh, that's the welfare technology. Um, and remember, welfare is connected to this state, which is uh, holding your hand from your uh, small baby until you are very, very old. Uh, and of course, you can also export uh, parts of that. 
so some examples of that is the nursing equipment. It's the hearing aids, so these uh, small apparatus if you, if you have uh, bad, bad ears, uh, and, and then different solutions for, for service. And there are actually 800 companies who are, who are active in this uh, sector with uh, 35,000 full-time employees. Uh, and it's 12% of total Danish exports. Uh, Oticon, that's the first company I mentioned on the, on the last line, that is uh, well known for the hearing aids. Uh, Coloplast, they're making these uh, different, um, what are they called? No, yeah, it's like plasters. If you have a blister from your shoe, you can get a Coloplast plaster to protect your, your foot. Uh, from. So uh, my wife is always carrying some of these in her, in her bag. Yeah. Uh, Falk Systematic, that's IT, but it's still related to this uh, welfare uh, area. Uh, then we have the banking financial sector, and, and I just want to mention Danske Bank, uh, Danske Bank, Danske Bank, uh, who's active in Moscow, St. Petersburg. Uh, worldwide, they have a revenue of 6 billion euro, 18,000 people, and more than 5 million customers. So it's, it's quite a massive bank. Um, and in Russia, they opened in 2007, uh, and they work only with corporate clients, so you cannot have your personal account there. But if you have a, a company, you can, you can, of course, work with Danske Bank. Uh, and they have a strategy of keeping to, uh, completely out of politics, uh, focus on economy, and uh, stay unbiased. Uh, and they see opportunities uh, despite sanctions. Uh, again, it's the case some Swedish bank, some German bank is going out of the market. Danske Bank is staying, so actually they have the potential to, to grow, uh, even though the total, the total market is uh, shrinking. So uh, just to wrap up, uh, I hope you remember a few uh, points about the welfare state. Uh, of course, also the flip side of the welfare state, which is the very high uh, tax rate a very high value-added tax. Um, it's not for free to have such a welfare state. And then if you should uh, next week think what, what did what this guy say, if you can remember three companies, Maersk, Novo and Arla, then you have the top three of, uh, of Danish uh, companies. Uh, and you heard quite a few words about the clean tech sector, all the wind turbines and the district heating and so on. Uh, and then agriculture and food. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'm ready to take your questions if you have any. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lindmark. Um, I just have one question and I will use my position. I just was wondering about uh, Grand Force. Uh, do they produce something for export or they just produce everything only for Russian market? Is it any economical possibility to produce, uh, to extend the production of green force here in Russia and trade uh, abroad? Is it cheaper maybe than in Denmark? And yeah, just was wondering about that. <laughs> it's uh, actually a good question. And, and uh, I'm not even sure if, if the original topic of my lecture was possibilities in Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union, mm -hmm. because basically well, Every company that, that, we, that we work with, they ask us, uh, what is this Eurasian Economic Union? And, and maybe if we start producing something in uh, Belarus, can we then uh, export it to yeah. uh, Kazakhstan and Russia and everywhere? Uh, and of course, I'm sure you know more about the Eurasian Economic Union than, than I do, uh, mm -hmm. but it's still developing. I mean, uh, there are a lot of plans, there are a lot of... Uh, things, papers being, uh, being uh, worked out, but we still really don't know what, how will this look in five years, uh, will it be uh, even expanded further, will there be more free trade agreements with uh, Asian countries, so, so basically it's a bit of a question mark, uh, but I'm sure that it's being considered by some of the companies when they place their investment that now mm -hmm. it's not only Russia, even though Russia is a huge country and, and more than 140 million people, but it's also all the Belarusians, all the mm -hmm. Kazakhs mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, Kyrgyz and Armenia. 
So, so, uh, so I'm, I'm actually sure it's being part of the strategy, mm. but it's also a little bit of a question mark. Yeah, because right now, yeah. It, only, it only started this union in January of this yeah, year, so it's, it's, still, it's still very new and developing. Uh, and as we sometimes say, this uh, European Union developed since the 1950s. So it took uh, actually 40 years before it became this mm -hmm. uh, uh, unity market for labor and for, for goods and so on. So it takes time also to mm -hmm. develop yeah, uh, something like that. Uh, and you know all the problems with the euro and so on. It's not easy, you know, to maybe make a single currency. Then you also need a central bank that can control the currency. And mm -hmm. so, so it's, I think it's a long process and, and you don't really know where it's going. It also depends on, uh, on uh, some people in Minsk and Almaty and so on. Yeah, I see. Thank you very much. So please don't be shy, someone else. Uh, possible to ask in uh, Russian also, I will happy to translate you. Okay, sorry, you was first. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, I have a question for you, for you. So the first question is, uh, do you have the alternative resources of, uh, of uh, the energy satisfy the uh, international demand of the Danish company? Or if, uh, if uh, it costs uh, Thank you. Uh, very good questions again. Uh, I think the first question is answered by this slide, right? It's 25% of the total energy consumption, which is now from the, especially the wind turbines, but there are also the solar solar panels. There's also this biomass that I mentioned where you where you burn something from the fields. Um, so, so that's currently 25%. The rest is uh, oil and gas, basically. Uh, of course, uh, the whole transport sector, all the cars and all the trucks, they run on diesel and, and uh, gasoline, so, so that's not really covered. We have some electric cars, but it's, you know, very few, uh, very few compared to the total amount of cars. Um, and, and then we have these uh, power plants that are working on coal or, or even on, on, on other uh, fossil fuels. Uh, so, so uh, at the moment it's 25%, but it will be increasing year by year. And, and also, as I said, the goal is uh, in 2050 to have 100% uh, coverage. Uh, to your second question, is, um, it's about the cooperation. And I actually think uh, we have quite a lot of things uh, we could work together on. And I mentioned this uh, part about the district heating, so how to, how to heat the whole city how to supply heat to the city of Novosibirsk in an efficient way. Because it gets extremely cold in the winter. Of course, you can just burn a lot of gas and, and uh, you can have it very warm in your apartment. If it's too warm, you can open the window. But, but we suggest, uh, or Danish uh, manufacturers, they suggest a smarter solution that you actually insulate your houses uh, with this uh, rock wool, that's one of the insulation companies. So you, you actually make your, your box around you more tight, uh, so you don't have the wind blowing into your apartment. And also you adjust the heat with these uh, thermo thermostats. Uh, well then, Thermostat. thermostats. Ah, thermostat. You can actually say, I would like uh, 20 degrees in my uh, living room and uh, 17 in my uh, sleeping room. Yeah. And, and you can actually adjust it like, like that. Uh, if you if you first you know insulate have a tight uh, insulated uh, house or apartment and then afterwards you adjust uh, the heat with these thermostats, mm -hmm. uh, you can actually have this very nice uh, indoor climate. At the same time, you save a lot of energy. I mean, you can save uh, eighty percent of the energy compared to how the houses are now in, in Novosibirsk. So, so I think in, in that area we have a lot of things in common. Uh, and, and of course it takes time because the houses, they are there and uh, it takes time to, to start insulating them. Uh, but whenever new houses are built, they are built to higher energy standards than the old ones. So it's, you know, uh, when, when you 
uh, are done in university and you have to go and buy a house, then I would suggest you look for an energy efficient house because it will it will save you basically money the whole your whole life all the time you have your apartment or your house. Uh, and I'm sure that energy costs, even in Russia, they are low, but they will increase also uh, during the next 10, 20, 30 years. Thank you. Someone else? Microphone? Hi. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting overview. Does, does this work? I hear you loud and clear. Yes, it's working. Okay. Uh, it's very good to hear that Danish companies are successful in the whole world and in Russia as well. But my question is, uh, what um, difficulties, what key difficulties uh, do Danish companies experience when working in Russia? Is it administrative issues? Is it uh, maybe customs, taxation or quality of uh, labor market in Russia? What are the key uh, difficult things? Thank you. I think it's a very individual question from company to company, right? Um, and, and of course the companies are in different stages. So the, the company who is getting one order to Russia, they will for sure experience the customs problem because they need to make all the documents in the perfect way with the stamp that should be round and completely perfect in the right spot. And there cannot be any, you know, difference between the invoice and the packing list and the whatever other document. So, so, so we help actually the companies who are very new to Russia, even before they send the container, we say, please check it, then check it once more, then send it to your Russian customer, ask them to check it. No, don't send it yet. You need to, you know, because it needs to be very accurate. Uh, and that's just a fact. Uh, and it's something that you can actually do if you are very thorough. Uh, so it's not impossible to, to solve this issue. But then maybe they, they go to the next step. They have established uh, some business throughout two or three years and they would like to open a sales office. Then they have the problem of finding a good Russian sales manager because they would like the person to be uh, English speaking, uh, good in writing also English. Uh, but they would also like the person to know about economy and to know about the cultural differences. And so they have a wish list, which is quite unrealistic, I think, uh, because you can get a candidate which is very good in English, but then maybe they don't know anything about selling or about the type of products they're supposed to sell. Then you can get an expert within uh, whatever oil and gas technology, but maybe they don't know English. So it's very difficult for the company to get this perfect sales manager. And sometimes the solution can be to hire three or four people. And then one of them is doing all the translation and communicating with the head office back in Denmark. The other one is running around with all the technical stuff. And, and you know, one is maybe good in making the brochure and making the marketing. So, so we also give them advice uh, on that. So, so I think it, it depends on Every company is different and, and they are, some of them, as you could see, were very big, already have the big factory, uh, but some of them are new uh, and they don't know anything, uh, basically. They know what they are being told uh, by the Russian customer or by the Russian distributor, and then they know what we tell them. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot read this in a book, basically, how to, how to do business in Russia. Thank you very much. Someone else has a question? Thank you. I have a question. Uh, then you account uh, statistic of export. Are you including uh, statistics of Farrera Islands in uh, Danish statistics, or this is a different pages? Because in our mass media, I think everybody forget that Farrera Islands is a part of Denmark. Thank you. It's a even better question, because I cannot answer it. Um, I, can, I can tell you that the Faroe Islands, they are, part of the, they are part of the Queen's territory, right? Mm -hmm. So there's Denmark, mainland Denmark, this map that I have in the beginning. Uh, it's good for you to see it again, if you don't remember how the country looks like. But then we have uh, somewhere to the left up in the roof, we have the, the Faroe Islands, uh, which are very small, only 30,000 people or something like that. But they have a lot of fish. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, and actually, the Faroe Islands, they are not members of the European Union. Wow. So they are not covered by the import restrictions. So they can export all the fish to uh, Russia. So at the moment, uh, a lot of uh, Faroese fishermen, they are driving around in the big uh, Mercedes cars because they can actually sell uh, all their fish uh, to Russia for a good price, of course. Uh, and I think if you go to a sushi place and order something with salmon, there's a high possibility that the salmon comes from the Faroe Islands because it's really the, one of the primary sources of, of this uh, fresh salmon uh, in Russia nowadays. Uh, another funny thing is they opened now an office in Moscow, the Faroe Islands. It's inside of our embassy, so we have the Danish embassy, but outside we have the EU flag, the Faroe flag and the Danish flag. So there are three flags there. And there's one Faroese diplomat sitting there working with the free trade agreement with the Europa Eurasian Economic Union and the Faroe Islands uh, because of all this fish business. So um, wow. I, I don't know if it's in the statistics, basically. I, I, guess, it's, I guess it's separate, actually. Um, very interesting information. Thank you. Uh, someone else? Wait. Well, um, I have a question about the uh, Carlsberg uh, beer, beer brands uh, that you have mentioned. Uh, do they use um, the technologies that are made in Denmark or uh, they are just uh, owned uh, by the Danish companies? Because, um, I mean, the taste makes me uh, think that the quality of uh, beer in Denmark is quite poor, actually. <laughs> I know that's maybe wrong, but still. I believe that they use uh, a lot of the Danish recipes, but of course it depends. I mean, if you have the, the, the lowest line on this slide, you have uh, Baltica, which is like, you know, from number zero up to number eight or nine or whatever. Uh, Nevskoy, which is also Russian beer, Russian recipe. But then you have Tuborg, that's a Danish uh, brand. And I'm sure they use the recipe and try to they try to match the taste of the Danish tubor, the original Danish tubor from Copenhagen, Denmark, as best they can. And I'm not sure if they succeed. Of course, it, you cannot match 100%, but I'm sure it's like 90, 95% is the same taste as the, as the Danish tubor. Uh, then they have this French brand, which is Kronenburg, so they have a licensed production of that. And I, I believe that they try to match the taste of the original French Kronenburg beer. So, I don't know if that answers your question. They have a Japanese beer even, which I think is more sweet and, uh, yeah. So, so they have uh, really a lot of brands. They also have a girl beer called Eve. So that's a, like pink, pink label and it tastes uh, almost not of beer, but it's, it's, it's uh, one of the Baltica brands. Thank you very much. Maybe. Any more? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> More, more comment than, than uh, question about beer. So Denmark is known, uh, well, versus Sweden, if, if we can compare Denmark to Sweden. I'm not sure if it's politically, politically, politically correct. Uh, but but uh, Sweden is known for uh, Swedish inventions that will later turn into enterprises. And Denmark was known for bringing inventions from abroad and building huge companies on, on uh, foreign in inventions. So Cosmic Beer was originally from uh, Bavaria, from Germany. That was a unique issue. So East from Bavaria were brought to Denmark and thus Cosberg company was, was uh, established. So originally German beer actually. Before Cosberg, nobody drank this wonderful uh, Euro Lager anywhere except for Germany. So it like C can I also make a comment? <laughs> do, do, do you know where the Viking Rurik he came from? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's a matter of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> or from Denmark? Denmark. Ah, oh, really? I thought from. Sweden. Maybe it's a matter of discussion, <laughs> but we say to everyone he's from Denmark. Rurik is Danish. I thought Swedish. You said <laughs> I said Norway. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> Everyone. So please have any, someone maybe have one more question to complete. 
Do you? Я могу перевести, если что. Thank you for the interesting lecture. May I ask the question too? I have two questions. The first, what factors can influence negative and and create the bad impact for Russian and the Denmark relations for economic market? And two, what opportunity for building a career do you say for the Russian student? Thank you very much for your question. Any? Yes, uh, actually one external factor which uh, is a part of many economic discussions, that's the oil price. And uh, I firmly believe that the very low oil price that the world is experiencing uh, now and, and probably also in the, in the years to come is uh, negative for the, for the trade between Denmark and Russia. And why is that? Of course, it's because we have these uh, niche companies like Welltech uh, that are active in oil and gas. Uh, and as you could see here, they are used to taking very high prices for their, for their products, otherwise they couldn't make a profit uh, of, of more than half of their revenue. Uh, and maybe with a low oil price, the, the oil companies will tend to look for cheaper solutions uh, than, than well tech solutions. So that's the one reason. But the other one is actually connected to the clean tech, Sorry. which is this uh, sector. Uh, wind turbines, energy efficiency, uh, biomass, all this. And again, that, that, that is a sector which is also competing with, uh, with fossil fuels, with the, with the uh, dirty or black energy. So if the price of oil is very low, then people don't want to invest into clean tech. Uh, so that is very, very closely connected uh, to, to that. So if I should point at one external factor which you cannot control and we cannot control which can have a negative influence or a positive influence once it gets uh, back up that will be the oil price uh, regarding careers i would say uh, i think i said it when 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 we talked about recruiting uh, recruiting new people uh, danish companies they are not afraid to recruit young people uh, you don't have to be uh, 40 or 45 to get a job in denmark actually a lot of companies prefer people more or less straight from the university um, because then you know they can start teaching them all the company values and they can start teaching them about the products and the brands from you know a uh, clean uh, clean mind somehow uh, so so it's it's not an age uh, question basically but it's uh, very important to be able to speak english so uh, the fact that you are sitting here and, and, and listening to a long, boring lecture in English, that's, that's already good for your future career because that's what is needed also in the Finnish companies, in the Swedish companies, uh, Norwegian companies. I think if you, if you work with a German company, it's better if you speak German. If you work with a Danish company, English is fine. Uh, and actually, we talked about before the lecture whether it would be good for you to, to, to learn some Danish. I actually don't think so. It's, it's nice to have, but if you have your English at a high level, that's what you need, basically. Of course, then you should still know something about the economy, you should know something about uh, doing business, uh, you should be uh, in, 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 all, in all ways, you know, um, uh, well-spoken, well-behaved. Uh, but, but the most important thing is actually that you know uh, one language uh, besides Russian. Uh, and if you have to decide between English and some other language, I would really recommend English. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question, or are we satisfied? So, um, I would like again to thank you, Mr. Lingman, for your lecture and for all the questions you have answered to us. It's really a lot of new I have got today, honestly. Um, and I hope you also have an 
enjoyed your time as well here. Very much. Um, so, um, if we have no questions, I would like to thank again and apologize, as will be our end of our lecture. Before you all get up, I have one uh, comment, extra comment. Uh, it's not related to the presentation and, uh, and the whole uh, economy thing, but tomorrow night, Tuesday, at 7 p.m., there'll be a Danish movie at the Angleterre Cinema, Angleterre Hotel Cinema. It's very rarely that you have a Danish movie in St. Petersburg. It's the first one since I was here, uh, one and a half years. Uh, it's mostly the language is in Danish, but all the subtitles are in Russian. And it's a historical uh, movie, quite a serious uh, topic. So it's not a feel-good movie, but it's, uh, I've seen it, it's really worth seeing. So tomorrow at 7 p.m. Thank you.